Good morning, Chair. Good morning. May I call Mr. Stephen Grayston, please? Yes, of course. <laughs> I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Could you state your full name, please? Uh, Stephen Robert Grayston. Um, and you should have a copy of your witness statement in front of you. Um, for the transcript, that's WITN 0392100. Um, have you got that statement there? Yes. Um, and if you turn to page 28, please. Is that your signature there? It is, yes. And it's dated the 14th of September 2022, is that right? It is, yes. Um, and is it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, it is. Um, that witness statement is now in evidence. Everything I'm going to ask you is supplemental. And can I first thank you for coming to give evidence to the inquiry today. Um, your statement covers a variety of issues, but today I'm going to focus on phase three issues. But if we could start by talking a bit about your background. Um, you started working for the post office as part of the Royal Mail Group in January 1986, is that right? Correct, yes. And you left the Royal, when the Royal Mail Group, or you left the post office when the Royal Mail Group split in April 2012? Uh, yes. Is that right? And you've worked a variety of IT jobs since then? Yes. In 1995, you were appointed as a manager in the BA POCL programme. Is that right? Correct, yes. And what did that involve initially? Um, the, the first role that I had um, was to support... Um, the evaluation of um, potential uh, partners, suppliers um, for the scope um, of the program. And, and my particular role was to look at uh, support, ser the support service uh, proposals. How did that change over time? Um, so as the program moved forward into its next phase, um, I moved into uh, the implementation team and then did various work in the implementation team, probably most um, significantly was around uh, in-office migration. Um, and I believe you were involved in the acceptance, and the acceptance process, is that right? I was, yes. Um, uh, the inquiries heard a great deal of evidence about the acceptance process, so I'm not going to take you through all of that. Um, but at the time Horizon was rolled out, did you believe the system was robust? Yes, um, there were bugs, there were, there, there were defects that had been captured and listed, but fundamentally uh, my understanding was that the system was working and producing figures and outputs that, that um, were consistent with transactions and, and the inputs that, that, that the system was, was receiving. You mentioned that you were aware of bugs, errors and defects. Yeah. Yeah. What were some of the issues that you were aware of prior to Rolloid or prior to the acceptance? Uh, I think within, within the material that I've been sent, um, there, there was various reports coming out of testing um, on um, what the results of running various scripts, et cetera, was, was showing. And, you know, as, as in any program that, that I've been involved in, um, you know, the, the good part is that these things are being flushed out, that they're, they're being understood, and they, they then need to be fixed. So, um, you know, the follow-on from that is an evaluation as to the seriousness either individually or uh, as a consolidated group of, of those uh, defects that are arising as a result of testing. Um, so there's, there comes a point where you, you, you evaluate whether to move forward because what remains to be fixed is deemed to be not significant um, or you, you hold and fix all the things that, that need to be fixed. 
Were you aware at that time about issues with EPOS, the electronic point of sale? Sorry, what, what depends. What do you mean by issues? I think it, well, problems that that had been a persistent issue, and the post office felt that that needed to be actioned by a pathway in order to correct it or to ensure the data integrity of the transactions that were being shown. From the material that I've been sent, um, I, I've seen um, reference to um, advice about rewriting EPOS. Uh, completely. Um, uh, that was that was uh, not something I was aware of. Um, that there were f concerns over fundamental issues. Um, no, I, I can't. You know, it, no, because as a as a effectively on the operational side, working with the the uh, regions, the IP uh, areas. It, it, was, it was our job to make sure that we had something that was being implemented that was trustworthy. And it was trustworthy at the time of Rolite, in your mind? Yes, yes. Um, if we could turn up our first document, please. Um, POL 00028441. Um, I'm just going to take you to this. This is a Christmas Horizon research report that was carried out in January 2000. Um, were you aware of this at the time? I, I believe I saw a copy of this, yes. What did you think of it at the time? Do you remember? Um, I, to, to some extent, it wasn't uh, a surprise. If, if you have uh, 60,000 uh, users... And then you have, you know, that's at the front front end, front office. And then you have users uh, in the back office, that they they struggle to to understand and use the system um, would would be expected from from some users. Yes. If we could turn over on to the next page, please. Sorry, the next page again. Yeah, we can see that this is Appendix Two. Yeah. which contains some verbatim comments from sub-postmasters. Yeah. And just to be clear, you saw the report and also this appendix at the time, or...? Um, I, I can't be absolutely certain, but I, I would have expected to see it, yes. If we could turn to page 15, please. And we can scroll down. The inquiry's been through this report before, but just for your benefit, um, there's a section entitled Not Enough Training on Balancing. Um, and we see there some of the comments. Training for accounting was very bad. Balancing took hours to sort out and was kept until midnight sometimes. Tried to call help desk, but it was almost always engaged, um, but needed more time on balancing. The first day was all right, but the quality of the training was not good on the second day. Um, and further down, they didn't inform us very much on cash accounts. So there's quite a lot of feedback. I'm not going to take you through it all. But it, it sets out that people were quite frustrated at the amount of time that was being spent on training on balancing. Hmm. Would you accept that? Yes. Is that something you mentioned a moment ago that you would expect a certain level of difficulty or people to find things difficult to a certain degree? Is this in line with what you would have expected? I think the, my expectation is, is, is a generalisation in terms of the change curve. You know, when you ask people who have worked in a certain way for a long time to change the way that they are working, then some will struggle and some will adopt the change very easily. I, I think, though, it, you know, in this in this particular point. Um, what was being referenced is that the training itself wasn't good enough. So irrespective of the general point of people struggling with um, adopting to, to the requirement for change, the training itself should be adequate to uh, allow people to operate the system. And if we turn to page 19, please. And scrolling down. We can see one section in, entitled, I'm not computer literate. 
So a moment ago you were talking about people who were used to working in a certain way. I mean, this shows the level that some people were at in terms of their base level of computing, doesn't it? Yes, yes. Um, and we can see that some people describe it as it was frightening. We were thrown in at the deep end and it was very unsettling. It was particularly difficult for those who had no previous experience with computers. They did not take into account our needs. And I'm not a computer person. I was put with people who had used them and with people who worked in a head post office. I did not need half the information given. It was a waste of time when there are other things I needed. Total confusion in the end. Um, so the post office were expecting people to go from not using computers at all in their day-to-day -day work to being across quite a complex system. Would you accept that? Yes. Uh, I, you know, the, the... Yes, yes. And it's fair to say, isn't it, that some postmasters at the beginning struggled to use the system? Yes. Yeah. Um, and would you accept that if someone finds a system particularly difficult to use they're more likely to make errors when inputting the data that's held on that system. Would that be right? I, I, I think that's, that's fair. You know, it, it's, it takes longer. Um, people who don't have the understanding, you know, even if there's a help desk, there's the, the call out for support. Um, but there is the risk of error, yes. Yes. Um, if we could take that document down, please. Um, and turn to NFSP 050513, please. Um, this is a, a report of the National Executive Council of the NFSP in March 2001. Um, now, you wouldn't have been at that meeting, but there's just one point that I wanted to take you to. If we could turn to page 15, please. And scrolling down, please. Um, so this is a Mr. Pebbody, who the inquiry has already heard from. Um, and it's him making a report to the meeting. He says, Mr. Pebbody reported that these problems are still being highlighted. This is polling problems. Um, and just recently have been circulated and reported on the problems in organising meetings with the business. But now monthly meetings have been scheduled and there had been a meeting on the 26th of February 2001 from which could be seen from the action points. There were 28 items that required action. Some of them the business still had to come back to them on. Amongst it, one was set up one was to set up the two-day meeting, a separate meeting on losses and gains policy, a separate group to bring in the Horizon problems. There have been stories about the problems that have been created by Horizon, <coughs> shortages. Horizon was not doing things, the problem with losses having to be made good immediately, and all the things about suspense accounts. He reported that he wanted a group to examine this. He had been led to understand that there was 10 million in suspense accounts now, as opposed to about 2 million, 18 months ago. Another feature of the system was that it highlighted everything. Um, so looking at that, it appears that after Horizon was introduced, the money held in a suspense account went from 2 million to 10 million. Is that right? Um, I, in terms of what, what, I, what I see on the screen and, and what Mr. Pebbody um, reported, um, yes, I mean, I, I heard... This, I can't remember the context in which I heard the same uh, point, um, but um, the point about suspense account and an amount going from two million uh, to ten million um, was something that came up in a conversation somewhere. I, I, I recognise that. Yes, you recognise that the, a conversation <laughs> around this time, March two thousand and one. Um, I, I can't. I can't say with any certainty of a specific date, but you know that that would be, um, I, I guess, roughly. Yes, it would be appropriate. Um, and that conversation, I appreciate you've said you don't really remember, but was it something that members of your team or you were particularly concerned about at the time? Yes, because that is a fivefold increase. And um, as I understood it, there was um, analysis 
going on. I mean, I think there was a, there was a, uh, I think Mr. Pebbity uh, states that um, you know everything was was being flushed out, and I think that was the context in which I heard um, you know the, the increase from two million to ten million that everything was 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 being flushed out, but that didn't explain uh, doesn't explain what you know what what, what is going on. Um, so I, I understood that there was some some analysis uh, on this going on. What do you mean by everything being flushed out? Well, because the the Horizon system um, had been implemented and therefore data was was flowing through the system, it wasn't manual. Um, the the information that was being received in finance through what was being reported as in suspense. Um, was much more visible, whereas before, um, for whatever reason, um, it, it wasn't. It wasn't that number. Um, what does that increase from two million to ten million suggest to you? Well, it it, it suggests that there there are errors that are being posted to suspense. Um, that need to be looked at. And what, you know, what, what, you know, my first question is, what, what has caused the posting to suspense of a five-fold increase? Uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And what do you think the reason was? I don't know. I, I honestly, I don't know. I mean, it, the, the analysis was going on, and speculation on my part was not going to help because I wasn't close to the detail, neither was I expected to be, you know, involved in the analysis or close to the detail. But there were other people that, that <coughs> with, with the right level of knowledge that you would expect were looking at this uh, and, and examining it. What were they saying about this? What was their theory? I didn't see, I didn't see any follow-up. I don't, you know, uh, as I say, the context in which, which I heard this you know, I'm comfortable in saying that uh, I recognise that, that, that comment, but I didn't see any follow-up that, that said, you know, this is the, this is the result of our analysis, um, you don't need to worry, et cetera, et cetera. But that Mr. Pebbity has seen it, um, you know, there were, there were others that, that understood it, and I expect there, there would have been a report somewhere um, stating what, what the cause was and what, what was happening. But even though you were aware of this fact, you didn't check to see what the outcome of that was? No, I didn't, no. <coughs> Does this not seem like quite an important point? It seems like an important point, it, yes. I mean, it, it, looking at it now, yes, it seems like so, something that should have been clearly understood and articulated back through uh, the programme so that the programme could then articulate what was going on back to the relevant business stakeholders. What I can't, having said that, what I can't say to you is that there may well have been a strand that had done the analysis and had reported back to various stakeholders. Um, it's, it, it, you know, in, in my world, it's, it disappeared. Um, moving forward in time then to the impact programme, um, you were change management lead on impact, is that right? Correct, yes. And what did that involve? Um, th so it, it involves understanding, uh, effectively understanding um, the nature of the change. So what, what was the business intention? Um, what, what was being changed um, by a business unit, whether it's finance, or operations, or audit. So, so what was changing process? What was changing system? And having done the gap analysis between what people did today and what they would be expected to do tomorrow, to work on um, training and processes to enable people to move from, from one state to, to the future state. In, in the area that the the change uh, the changes were had the highest level of impact for example in in, in areas in finance um, organizational design would would come into it because you may have people exiting the organization 
and new skills and new people coming into the organization. Um, and depending, and I, I, depending on the scope of business change, and I, I can't quite remember, but there's also the point about communication. Um, so, you know, communicating to stakeholders as well. And um, from what you've said, it doesn't sound like you were involved in the primary decision making in terms of what it would actually involve. Your role was to do with carrying out the changes that other people had decided upon. Is that fair? Yes. I mean, the documents that, that I was sent were, you know, clearly laid out, you know, in terms of uh, business strategy and, and what the, the reasoning behind uh, the impact programme. Yes. Um, you set out what you understood the purposes of the impact programme to be in your witness statement. If we could pull that up at WITN 03920100. And if we turn to page 20, please. And looking at paragraph 52, scrolling down, it says, I believe that the impact programme was driven by the need to simplify and update the many back-end legacy systems to improve efficiency, accuracy and lower operational costs. At the front end in offices, the programme was introduced. The programme also introduced the capability for smart card transactions and changed the suspense account process from manual to an automated process. The releases also introduced various other changes to the Horizon system that were related to either products or service improvements. So, is that how you understood the purpose of the project or the uh, programme? That's that's my reflection. Now, I might have been able to give you a more detailed statement a few years ago, uh, but yes, yeah. Um, did you hear the evidence of Mr. Philip Boardman? I, I, I think I did. It was only a few days ago, wasn't it? So. Yes. Um, he told the inquiry that part of the simplification process that Impact envisaged was so that debt would be more visible. Do you agree with that? Debt would be more visible in the in the sense of uh, the suspense account. In, in what context was? Well, simplifying things so that it's more obvious what debt is owing by either the sub postmasters or by clients. Yes, I mean the the, the you know uh, in my understanding, you know part of part of the uh, reasoning was to ensure that data was generated accurately at, at the counter, that it was harvested into the finance systems accurately, and then passed to, to clients accurately and in a timely manner. Uh, I think in the legacy world, and I, I, you know, I'm not an expert on the legacy systems by any uh, stretch, but um, there, there were timing discrepancies that would arise. So, you know, one of the things about simplification and the use of, uh, you know, the, the new systems was to increase speed, accuracy, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, summarising that, I suppose, is do you agree that part of the reason for the programme was that the post office felt that cash was going missing? Yes, yes. Was that a big driver? Um, it wasn't... It, it was it was definitely a driver. I mean, I think there was there was reference to uh, you know remittances, for example, um, into into branches you know that where 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 leakage or, or loss was, was being experienced. So you know if if as a process you can automate remittances um, and tighten up that process, then you're reducing the risk um, of of loss or leakage. Um, so yes, it was it, it was definitely a driver of the program. Um, if we could turn up uh, POL 00038870. Um, this is the Accounting and Cash Management Programme Conceptual Design. And if we scroll down, we can see your name is not on the list as Programme Manager or a Design Authority. But you would have seen this document at the time? At the time of the conceptual design, um, uh, sorry, can you just give me the date of the... Yeah, so if we scroll over, I think this is a date, if we scroll over onto page um, five. Uh, 
we can see that this, the document history is September 2003, if we scroll down to the bottom. Yes, I mean, I, I think at, at that point I, I, I would have expected to see it, yeah. Yes. Um, and if we could turn to page 14 of that document, please. And scrolling down, please. We can see at 3.2.2 the key priorities in this context. And it says two fundamental changes have made Post Office Limited's funding position a critical business survival issue. One, the business is trading at a loss. Two, the migration of benefits to ACT will be accompanied by the loss of pre-funding by government departments of the necessary cash in the network. The business now has to borrow funds to fund its trading losses and to fund working capital needed in branches. Such borrowing is limited in availability and its costs add to the trading loss. From April 2003, DTI, Department of Trade, will provide a loan and will require a robust statement of cash holding as security. Um, so at that time, the post office was trading at a loss and in a pretty dire financial situation. Is that right? Um, yes, as far as I was aware, yes. yes. And could you help us with, at the time, was that something that was troubling people or worrying people? Was that something that people felt had to be actioned quickly? Well, it, it had been troubling. I mean, the, the, if, if I just focus on the, the second point, um, you know, the, the, in 1995, um, it, it, the, the point about ACT was already recognised and the threat that, that uh, benefits payment uh, by ACT represented. Um, so for a, a number of years through Horizon uh, Impact um, and then the Post Office Card Account Program, this, this threat um, to, to Post Office and the financial position had, had first of all been recognised but then had materialised. So there was a need to bring in cash, is that right? There, there was a need um, because uh, the, the payment of pensions and allowances was the significant product and so, or service that offered, was offered by post offices. Without being able to replace, if, if that business was lost, without being able to replace it, then the post office's position would, would become worse financially, yes. So it needed yes. cash, yeah. Um, and part of impact was automating the part of the accounting process that had previously been in, uh, conducted in Chesterfield, the error reconciliation, is that right? There were a number, 300 people in Chesterfield who were carrying out checking processes. Yes, it was uh, like a, fa a big paper factory, yes. Yeah. Um, and so part of what was, was envisaged was the reduction of, of those costs and move to automation, is that right? Correct, and that's when I talked about organisational redesign. That would have been, yeah, one and of the areas. Most of the people who were based at Chesterfield doing that job of checking, they would have they would have been removed essentially after impact or cut down severely. Yes, um, yes. And would you accept that part of the impact program um, envisaged the shift of responsibility from that team to identify errors? to the sub-postmaster to identify the errors in the branch? I think there's two, two, perhaps two parts to it. I think um, part one would have been that the introduction of the systems should have exposed errors quickly, which would have resulted in automated error notices is being generated back to offices more quickly. Um, but uh, the onus would be on the people in the post office, the, the office manager or sub-postmaster, yes, to, to understand how an error had, had occurred if, if their account was not, was not balancing. Or identify the error before it's put in, because they're the people who are putting in manually the processes and handling it on a day-to-day -day basis, isn't that right? They're certainly handling the transactions on a day-to-day -day basis, yes, yeah. Um, so they would be the ones in the first instance who are responsible for identifying those errors, correct? Yes. Um, and at this stage, was the reliability of Horizon taken as a given? Uh, 
uh, the, the, the fundamental horizon system and its ability to, to accurately represent figures um, through transactions and represent those into the back-end systems, yes. That there were still um, individual issues um, or, or defects that, that you know, needed to be fixed, you know, as a matter of, you know, in, in my experience, as a matter of course, that you will inevitably always find some defect, even if you, you've gone through extensive testing. Uh, but something will always turn up. It's the seriousness of what turns up that, that needs to be assessed. And that's why we had uh, NBSC and the HSHD. So the, the way of double checking it, so you first, in the first instance have the sub-postmaster, but then the secondary rule is those helplines, the NBSC and the HSH, is that what you're saying? Yes, I mean, the, the, you know, they're absolutely fundamental. Uh, absolutely fundamental from from early in the program that that people are contacting um, you know the help desk creating the the the, the view the data that, that then has professional people analyzing what what the story is behind what is being reported but that's always going to be limited, isn't it? Because the people on the helpline aren't in the branch with the person on the grind, isn't it? They're going to have to go off what they can see on the system, potentially, and what the sub-postmaster tells them. Isn't that right? Correct. But if there is a recurring theme um, in calls coming in, um, you know, you, users, p people express themselves in different ways. Um, and and it, it, if there is an art in it, it's to understand and articulate into the, the, the help desk system um, what what the problem is and what the proposed rectification is. But what, what you would expect is that with recurring issues, there is action taken, even, even if it's not a system issue. So it may be that the you know, training itself, or a, a note needs to go out to branches to say, you know, we have received um, concerns from sub postmasters over this type of transaction. Please be aware, you know, to take this particular action. So it doesn't necessarily always have to be system driven, uh, but the analysis is is critical. Yeah. But at this time, did you think back? To what we've been discussing about the value of money in the suspense account and think, oh, I wonder if someone bottomed out why that money had gone from two million to ten million. No, I didn't. Do you think that that would have been something with the benefit of hindsight you should have done? With the benefit of hindsight, yes, yes. Um, if we could turn to the next document, um, POL 00038878, please. So this is a similar, uh, another document to do with conceptual design. This is branch trading, reporting, management and control and transaction management, conceptual design. Again, would this have been the kind of thing that you would have seen at the time? Yes, I mean, there, there, there would have been a lot of um, documents um, being circulated talking about uh, design. Um, and I can see from the, from the contribution that different areas of, of the business were, were obviously contributing to that, that view. Can you explain what you mean by that? Uh, well, I think from from my recollection i mean uh, in there it looks like there's um audit there's obviously finance um investigations team could you just um i think you're going through the names of contributors and you're could you just tell us um the name of the person in the field that they're speaking to uh tony uh tony Utting, i think would have been representing um investigation or, or audit in in that area and clark um was um, you know, an expert in, in uh, the processes within, within Chesterfield. Uh, Karen Hilsden, I think, had been involved in the, in the conceptual design. Um, uh, and Gareth Jenkins, obviously, was, was uh, there from uh, uh, ICL Pathway. Did you know Gareth Jenkins? Um, no, I didn't, uh, but I've seen his name 
uh, a few times uh, on, on various documents, yeah. Did you know him by reputation at the time? No. Uh, uh, you know, I know um, he was a, an architect or the senior architect. Um, you know, the, 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 my, my uh, interface with the, the architect team primarily would have been uh, Torsten. Um, um, and I think it was Torsten that probably had the, the most conversation with Gareth. That's Torsten Godson? Yes, yes. Um, if we could turn to page 13 of this document, please. Um, and we scroll down. We can see again recorded are some of the key priority or the key priorities um, of the impact program, which state uh, make the identification of debt easier, reduce the amount of reconciliation required increase the amount of debt recovered, put the emphasis on clients and customers to validate the date, simplify branch processes by reducing the amount of paper, centralise and consolidate agents' debt, and enable matching of cash at branches with settlement with the client. Mm. Um, those are consistent with some of the things we have been talking about, aren't they? Yes. And if we look further down at business drivers and issues... Um, it states, refocus on debt recovery, financial recovery of money, target 95%. Um, do you know what that would have been referring to? Well, I, I, my, my assessment of that is that um, where losses ha had occurred then it was the recovery of the monies associated with those losses or discrepancies. And primarily, I, I guess, that would have been focused on, on the branch. The sub-postmasters or, br or branch staff. Yeah, yes. And when it says in the second bullet point, only 10% of discrepancies are actually debt, yes. what would that have meant? Uh, my interpretation of that um, is that I think I mentioned timing discrepancies previously. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the challenges with the legacy systems was to um, remove uh, what, what looked like debt. It wasn't actually debt. It was just the timing of cutoffs in systems when, when data was provided to other systems. And that was subsequently resolved. So it's a timing issue rather than... Can you just explain that again? I can explain my understanding. So my understanding is that um, if, there, if at the point that data is sent to, for example, a client, that data from the front office may, under the legacy world, may not have reached the central system. So there may be that um, money had been taken in, but wasn't the data wasn't represented back to the client in um, a timely manner, and that might represent debt in certain circumstances. In the majority of circumstances, or? Well, I mean, it says ten, only 10% of the discrepancies are actually debt. Um, so, um, you know, my, as I say, my interpretation of that point as I'm sitting here today is I, I can relate it to timing. 90% uh, seems a high number, but I, I, I didn't work in the back end in Chesterfield in, in finance, so you know that, that could well be accurate, yes. And if we look at the bottom of business drivers and issues, it says accounting and settlement on our data, not clients. Yes. So when it says our data, that basically means the horizon data. Is that right? Yes, and and uh, you know it's a it's a challenge that I, I've I've uh, come up w against uh, you know in other programs where um, settlement on client data um, versus the data that you have in house um, leads to lots of questions. Yes. So from this, the horizon data is becoming all the more important, isn't it? It's the Absolutely. sort of end of the matter. Yes as regards settlement with clients, is that right? Absolutely. If you, want, um, if you want your clients to settle on your data, then your data has to be good. And so all of this is predicated on the idea that, to use your words, the horizon data is good. Yes. Because without that, none of this works. Yes, it, it, yes, it raises too many questions. 
If we could turn to page 15 of that document, please. Before we do that, could I just understand the word client? Um, Mr. Grayson, do you understand client to include sub postmasters, or are we talking about third parties whose products are being sold in, in post offices? Third parties, sir. So I, I, right, so w where we see in this list um, accounting and settlement on our data, not clients, you will view is that does not refer to sub postmasters. Correct. Right, okay. Um, if we could turn over the page, please, to 15 and scroll down. And down again, looking at paragraph 12. Uh, just down a bit further, thank you. Um, it states, um, by the end of a monthly trading period, branches should be required to make good discrepancies between horizon-generated cash and stock positions and the actual physical position determined by branch office staff. To help facilitate this, existing horizon facilities that permit branch staff to post cash discrepancies to a cash suspense account will be removed. Remaining branch suspense accounts should only be used following prior authorization by a post office central processes and will be restricted to use by branch staff with horizon manager slash supervisor rules. Um, is that in accordance with your understanding of, of what was to happen? Yes. Um, and it goes on to, exp I mean, essentially what's saying here is the suspense account is going to be removed effectively, which is where sub-postmasters previously posted discrepancies, isn't that right? Yes, uh, the, the ability, yes, I mean, it, the, the ability to post to suspense um, lay with a, a, a sub-postmaster or, or a Crown Office branch manager, should, should they choose. Um, under the changes, that facility was, was no longer going to be there. It was, it was being closed down. Um, at the time this programme was being developed, was there a perception that sub-postmasters were using the suspense account to hide money that they couldn't account for or had stolen? Yes. How prevalent... Uh, and unpacking that a bit, um, was it generally the perception that sub-postmasters were using it to hide amounts they'd stolen? Um... So in, in my experience, because prior to joining the program, I, I had been with Royal Mail Group investigations, um, there were instances where um, sub-postmasters wished to, to use an amount of money for other purposes, not, not with the intention of theft or permanently deprive, but wanted to or needed to use it for other purposes. So it, it was a facility or, or an opportunity, should someone so wish, to, to undertake something short term um, using uh, post office cash. There were instances, I believe, where it, it involved theft. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of analysis within post office on the types of cases, the numbers of cases, the amounts involved um, that, that uh, you know, were, were regularly discussed at, at a post office management level. You mentioned using the money for short-term purposes. Yes. Um, that's not something that they were allowed to do, though, was it, to use that money in the suspense account for short-term purposes? No, no. So that's something equally post office would want to clamp down on and didn't want to continue? Yes, but it's, it's, I was distinguishing between somebody who, who um, perhaps was, you know, or was stealing and somebody who was, was, was in, in need of a, an amount of money, but it was not with the intention of keeping that money. Yeah. Yeah. But post, in both cases, post office didn't want them to be, well, they certainly didn't want them to be stealing, but they also didn't want them to use that money for those purposes either. Well, they? it was post office money, not the private business side money, yes. Um, over the page, um, the document goes on to explain that the suspense account can be cleared in several different ways, and that includes cash or transaction, the sub-postmaster paying for out of their salary or credit card. Um, I mean, in the impact programme... 
um, there was no provision here to challenge the sum owing on Horizon itself, was there? I, I think when the Horizon produced a position, um, then, as, you know, my understanding was that there was an opportunity to challenge, but it wasn't through the, you know, through the system necessarily. It would have been through your retail line manager, maybe a call to the Horizon system help desk saying that, you know, this has happened, but under, I don't know why. Um, so, but that was the, the process about making good was, was what was agreed, yes. Yeah, so there was nothing on the system itself. You, it, you, what you've just described involves phoning yeah. the helpline, yeah. but not on the system itself. You yeah. can dispute. Yeah. Um, if we could turn to page 18 of that document, please. And scrolling down um, and looking at legal and regulatory. It says, it will be verified that branch processes and reporting changes meet legal and regulatory financial reporting constraints, e.g. auditors to ensure there's sufficient information from the new system to support regulatory reporting, litigation, and criminal prosecution. Um, was the ability to prosecute sub-postmasters um, under the criminal justice system a key um, driver or a key factor in the impact programme? Um, I, th I think with any system, I mean, if, you, if you looked back to um, ECHO uh, or ECHO Plus, which was in Crown offices, that the same statement would, would I expect, apply, i.e. that the system produces data which is trustworthy uh, to the extent that it can be used to support, if necessary, a, a criminal prosecution. Yeah. And in your mind at this time, how important was it within the post office to have the ability to prosecute sub-postmasters? I actually think it was, it, at this point in time, if, if anything, perhaps it was diminishing. I mean, you know, the, 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 the uh, prosecution of uh, an individual, uh, uh, you know, that, that post office went through was, was not, uh, you know, a, a cheap, um, it, was, it was expensive and, um, but uh, on the other side, it, you know, it, it was the deterrent effect as well. So the deterrent effect was still important, even if you felt that prosecutions themselves were becoming less important. Is that what you're saying? Well, resolving in some appropriate way was absolutely important. If, if a situation was so significant and serious that prosecution was merited then you know prosecution was appropriate but uh, yeah so it, it is important though that if if that is the step that you take the the data on which you are basing your decision is robust is accurate and um, if we could turn to page 70 of this document please Um, in fact, if we could look, go back over the page to page 69 and scrolling down, just so you can see the context of what I'm asking you about. This is in the context of discrepancy management, um, and it mentions, one, receive automated message, and two, handle transaction corrections. And we can see there the receive automated message section, but if we go over the page... I wanted to ask you about handling transaction corrections. Um, so you can see there the description says, this is the mechanism for processing the transaction correction by the branch. It says trigger, user initiated, automation. There will be a button for transaction correction management within the menu hierarchy, which is only accessible by users with the appropriate rule. This will provide the user with a list of the unprocessed transaction corrections displayed in date slash time order. Having selected the transaction correction to process, the system will display text making it clear what will happen when they select any of the options presented. For each transaction correction, the user will have up to three options. Each op option, when selected, will perform an identified set of transactions defined within the transaction correction which may include an option to do nothing requesting further investigation. 
Should the transaction corrections fall, fail validation, then an error is displayed to the user with a request to contact MBSC. The transaction correction will be marked as complete, but no change will have been made to the local system. Um, what type of situation does this envisage, or how would this work? Um, to be honest, I'm not quite sure. I'd, I'd have to take that away and have a, a long, That's hard fine. look at that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, turning then to our next document, if we could turn up POL 00038909, please. We can see here Impact Programme S80 Migration Strategy. Um, could you explain what this document is and how it came about? Um, the, well, a migration strategy um, would, would define how you move from what you have or where you are to where you want to be. And uh, in that sense... You know, without, I'd need to see the rest of the document as to what the scope was. Um, and we know it refers to the S80. Right? Yes. And yeah. um, if we could just look at your witness statement, um, and that's WITN 0390, sorry, 20100, please. And if we can look at page 23. and looking at paragraph 57, says within the scope of the S80 release changes were introduced that moved office accounting away from cash from weekly cash account production to trading periods and also introduced an automated process to manage unclaimed payment and uncharged receipt that existed as the office level suspense account. Up until the S80 release errors made by office in transacting business have been dealt with through the paper process that required office managers to post details, in brackets, enter details, of the error notices into the suspense account, S80 introduced an automated posting process. So can you explain and clarify further what the S80 did? Uh, in, in the sense of this particular point, um, my understanding, if I'm remembering it correctly, was that um, error correction was a, was a manual process. We talked before about the factory and all the people working on pieces of paper. Uh, well, those people working on those pieces of paper would turn up errors um, and that would generate a, a paper error notice, which then would need to be posted back to, to the branch that made the, the error. And now, if, if things were working well, um, the branch, because this may be some time later, the branch would already have recognised in the accounting period that an error had been made. So when the error notice came in, it was a contra-entry in suspense to the error that had already been recognised, if everything was... If everything was working properly. ...going great. Um, the S80, or impact... Um, introduced an, an automated process. Um, so on the basis that data was being generated into the systems and at the back end, um, the, the ability for those systems to process the data, that any discrepancies could then be posted automatically, uh, recognised automatically and posted uh, automatically, is, is my very simple, simple way of, of understanding it. So it was, the S80 was an important release for making that fundamental... I mean, it's quite a fundamental change, isn't it? It is a fundamental change, yes. Um, if we could turn back to that document that we were on before, which is POL 00038909, please. Um, if we turn to page 6... Um, we can see the date of this document, which is the updated draft for discussion is the 21st of June 2004. Um, and this is for discussion in the Design Authority. What is that? Um, the Design Authority um, were 
uh, effectively the people that had uh, analysed and thought through conceptually what impact was about, and then it had been broken down into constituent parts. And the design authority, or my interpretation of a design authority's job, is to protect the design. Um, as as you, you may appreciate, um, the world is not standing still as this program is taking place. So there, there are always new changes, maybe product changes, new products, challenges to the design coming in. And it is the job of the design authority um, to, that, that effectively owns the requirements to make sure that the design remains consistent and, and gives a view on, on CRs, change requests. If we could look at page 30 of that document. And scrolling down slightly, the rules and responsibilities section. Um, it says, the responsibility for leading the detailed migration analysis lies with the impact business change team, primarily Steve Grayston, business change manager, and Clark, um, back end, uh, Ben Gildersleeve, counter, and Mark Kirkton, implementation. Um, so that was your business change team, is that right? Um, I think it was it was wider than that, but given that um, the, the highest level of impact was back end, um, to Anne Clark and at counter, uh, Ben, yes, yes. And you would work with these people to carry through the changes that have been designed, is that right? Yes, uh, I mean the 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 fundamentally, you know, the the conceptual design needs to be understood. For example, you know, counter. If you took counter, the front office, you need to understand what what is changing. So, what is expected and what needs to be done in terms of process, eventually, so that you can define the right level of procedural documentation and the right level of training, and that behind that there is the right level of understanding in the support desk to support the people when this change is going through, and. You know, there's also, uh, as part of that, an evaluation uh, of what is needed at the point of migration from what happens today to what needs to happen tomorrow. If we could turn to page 20 of this document, please. And scrolling down, it says preparation to implement POL um, under hyphen FS um, and it says the following activities are required and, and lists a number of activities in terms of the hardware and software implementation and scrolling down um, it says in Paul FS activities must be undertaken to load the start of the financial year opening balances from uh, CBDB what does that mean uh, counters business database um, into POLFS and POLFS is? Uh, SAP, I believe. Um, this is in addition to any identified previous year closing balances and movements that need to be put into POLFS to create the correct starting position. There is also an activity to address the position of the suspense accounts, both centrally and locally, particularly as the current unknown items option will no longer be available to the branch. An exercise to cleanse suspense accounts in advance of implementing POLFS is envisaged. So this is the process of cleansing the suspense accounts to move forward with the plan. Is that right? Yes, I think um, uh, cleanse... Um my understanding in terms of, of this use of this term is it was envisaged that um, operations team, so so the the um, line management operationally and the sub postmasters would be encouraged to deal with items in suspense because items were sitting in suspense, I believe, sometimes for an ex extended period of time. Um, that document can come down, thank you. Um, do you think the suspense account was m removed because the post office desperately needed the money in the suspense accounts? No, no I, don't, I don't believe that was, that was um, a primary driver for, for closing uh, the suspense account. To, to me, it was a, um, 
it was an appropriate action to take if you were running true end-to-end -end processing. You didn't need, or you shouldn't need, uh, the ability to manually post into uh, an office's accounting position. Um, so I, I, d I, don't, I don't believe it was, it was a, a primary driver. Not a primary driver, but do you think it was a factor? Well, I think, you know, if, 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 if it was envisaged, and I, d I can't say that I ever saw it anywhere, that it was envisaged that as a result of, of impact being implemented that there would be a, um, you know, significant inflow of funds, um, I, I, you know, possibly in somebody's mind somewhere that might have been a factor, but I, d I can't say I saw that. Um, I want to ask you some questions about feedback from sub-postmasters. Um, you talk in your um, witness statement about feedback being obtained. Yeah. Um, if we could turn up WITN 0392100, please. And if we could turn to page 23... And looking at the bottom of that page at paragraph 60, it says, um, whilst I'm unable to reference specific notes or documents, I can confirm that user feedback was important to the impact program team and that feedback would have been taken on board and acted upon where appropriate. The, and then scrolling over, feedback would have included comment on user interface such as screen workflow, colours, positioning on screen, understanding of language used in instructions. There would also have been feedback gleaned from users interacting with the testing team with the aim of reducing the risk of errors. Whilst I cannot provide any specific example, I am sure that not all user feedback was accepted. For example, if a user disagreed with a fundamental aspect of the concept, the business design, I believe the overall business benefit to Paul would have been the overriding necessity. Um, could you explain a bit more about what you mean by that? Yes, I, 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 um, the, the, the high level design and the conceptual design of what post office was, was attempting to achieve, was setting out to achieve, um, was signed off and agreed, and agreed between post office management and I believe with relevant stakeholder groups. Um, inevitably, um, you get people who will actually disagree and challenge the fundamental conceptual design. And, you know, that, that's, you know, here is one example. It's happened to me in other programs. Um, but, you know, what I take from that is that it's about explaining the benefits of the program overall, because in isolation, somebody may be sitting there being asked to do something different and not understanding or realizing the benefit to the organization as, a, as an overall factor. Um, so, you know, that's, that's where um, people would express their views, um, but that feedback would not necessarily be taken on board. However, um, what should be taken on board is that if, if there is a fundament, fundamental lack of understanding why this is being done, what the benefit is overall to the organisation, then, you know, business change sh should reinforce the reasons behind why the change is happening. So if a sub-postmaster sub said... I don't, I don't agree with the fact that the suspense con is going to be removed. That's not something that would have been taken on board because it's fundamental to the programme itself and the design of it. Is that right? It is, but I would expect out of, you know, courtesy and the appropriate professionalism that, uh, you know, a, a, a rounded response would be given to the person who'd raised the point. But it couldn't be changed. The impact programme was what it was fundamentally yes. and feedback could be sought on more peripheral or user-based things, such as the interface. Is that right? Yes. Um, if we could turn up uh, POL 00038986, please. Um, so this is the impact program implementation plan for the S80 release. Um, can you help us with what this document is? Um, 
well, I would expect um, it to include all the details of how um, S80 would would have been uh, implemented, as it says, at a high level. I'm not sure what the detail is after that. Yeah, and the difference between an implementation plan and a migration plan. Yes, well, the, the uh, migration is part of the overall implementation. Okay, but they're two distinct things. You would expect to have separate plans for them, would you? Yeah, I would expect the overall implementation plan to highlight the migration perspective. Um, and then as you drill down into detail, that, that you get a, a migration plan and processes, etc. as you go into further levels of detail. Um, we can see here that you're a reviewer of this document. Yeah. Um, and so as a reviewer, does that mean that you would have um, had input into it or you would have had a look at it at the time before it was finalised? How would that have worked? Yes, as a reviewer, um, yes, I, I was expected and required to provide um, feedback from a business change perspective. And, you know, I think it's always important um, that the people who are reviewing documents like this understand the scope of their review because S80 was complex. So we can all make comments about some of the technical aspects, but if the technical aspect is not your domain, um, those comments wouldn't necessarily, you know, carry any weight. If we could turn to page six, please. We can see there the in, in the introduction it says the purpose of this document is to provide visibility and understanding to the impact program and relevant BAU domains. BAU? Business as usual, yes. Um, of a high level business implementation for BT and Pool FS and the main activities for the initial pre implementation stage. This document is largely derived from the migration strategy and meetings held with the business area representatives. It outlines the high-level implementation approach that will govern and guide a lower-level BT and Paul FS implementation plan. And if we move to page 7, scope um, says the high-level plan scope includes... So when it talks about the high-level plan, these are the things that are going to happen as a kind of headline point. Is that right? Yes, yes. Um, and we can see um, it sets out a number of things that are going to happen. Um, and if we look at paragraph 9, it says distribution of materials to branches in the MBSC, including training and operational instructions. Number 10, development of branch error scenarios and scripts for the MBSC. Um, and number 12, training of MBSC in types of calls and changes to BT. Um, after impact and after S80, the S80 release, the MBSC was going to be extremely important, wasn't it? Uh, the, yes, MBSC was extremely important. Yeah. Before and, but even more so after these changes. At, at any release and any change, there is a curve of increased volume calls, etc. So yes, the, the support services, the support desks should should expect to receive an increased volume of, of calls, yes. But over and above, surely, what you would normally expect with a release, because as we were previously discussing, this is now the way that you can dispute what Horizon is showing you, right? Yes. So on the long term, you would expect not just a peak after the release, but a peak going onwards, wouldn't you? Correct. I mean, that's part of the volumetric um, analysis that is undertaken for support services. You know, what what is the baseline position? How is that baseline likely to change? And and what is the curve or what is the, the bow wave of increased calls likely to look like? Do you remember that being something that was considered or thought about carefully at the time? I, I believe it was, yes. Um, And do you think that all things considered the impact programme was a success and that it met its objectives? I, I don't remember seeing a closure report. Um, I, 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 may, I might be wrong about this, but I, I can't recall seeing a closure report or closure analysis. Um, but in terms of the points that you've gone through, um, and the implementation that 
took place, I believe it was, you know, it, it, it achieved what it set out to achieve um, at the headline, headline level. Did you investigate with the MBSC what the impact of the impact programme was or, or how those calls in, increased over time? The, I, I think, you know, the, the, the approach uh, which, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned is a standard approach is that the, the implementation takes place and there is, a, there is a handover at each branch or to, from the programme to business as usual. And NBSC, um, in the early stages, is supported by the program. So yes, we we would have been looking at the, or should have been looking at, um, the calls being raised with NBSC and the Horizon System Help Desk. There should be analysis going on to see if there is an improvement required in training or communication or what, 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 what are we seeing? Yes. Um, at this time, were you aware that Fujitsu were able to access the data generated by the counter remotely and input into it? No, and I, I you know, this is a, this is, this is something that, um, you know, I, 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 I've, I've seen referenced, um, but at the time, no, and it, it, to me. It, you know, it, to me, it just seems troubling. Um, perhaps there was a full, there is a full audit log, but giving somebody access to the back end to inject data, um, you know, I, I, I very it would be very uncomfortable um, with, with that. If you'd known that at the time, how would that have impacted on your view of how appropriate it was? To place such stock on Horizon data. Well, it would it would be it would be extremely concerning. Uh, you know, you, you cannot. Uh, I mean, I I don't. If if there is a, I've not seen the reasoning behind it. So if there is justification behind it, and there is visibility, and it is audit, auditable, and it is clearly articulated as a record somewhere of what was done, who did it, and why, then there may be a legitimate business reason. But sitting here, knowing what I know, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound appropriate. Um, thank you, Mr. Grayston. Those are all my questions. Um, I'm just turning to see if um, any of the core participants have questions. Um, I can see Mr. Steen does. Uh, sir, there's a matter that's been brought to my attention in an email that I'd like to take some instructions on. Um, it is now uh, quarter past 11. I wonder right. whether I could use this time and ask for 20 minutes to have a break. Yeah, certainly. It, it may be I have no questions, but I just want to make sure. That's fine. I, is anyone else um, intending to ask any questions, just so that I know? Yes, Miss Patrick what? and Miss Page. Yes, please, thank right. you. So, um, it, what is it now? 11.15 or thereabouts? Yes, sure. Yeah. 11.30? Yeah, 11.30, Mr. Steen, unless you send a message that you need a little longer, all right? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. I believe Mr. Steen has some questions. So I'm very grateful for the, uh, for the time. It allowed me uh, just a couple of minutes to gather my thoughts and uh, take instructions. Um, Mr. Grace and I, I represent uh, a large number of sub-postmasters and mistresses. Um, and I've only got a couple of questions that relate to your evidence you've given today. You've spoken to Miss Kennedy uh, about the uh, branch suspense accounts and about the impact program that uh, then, as a result of that program, removed the suspense accounts, OK? Uh, you've also discussed with Miss Kennedy the fact that, that at one stage, within the branch of suspense accounts that it reached a surprising amount of money, went up to about 10 million. Okay, right. Now, um, help us first of all with what you believe that 10 million pounds in those branch suspense accounts meant. What did it represent? Oh, I wasn't sure. I, I, the, con the context of knowing about this two million to ten million 
is unclear to me. I, I, it wasn't. It didn't come to me formally, but uh, s somewhere it came up. Now, for it to go from two million to ten million in suspense means that there was errors that were being posted to suspense. Now, I don't know what those errors were, but that the purpose. My understanding was analysis was ongoing. When you say errors, if we can just tease this out gently, mm -hmm. when you say errors, do you mean? Um, Errors within the horizon system, errors being made by, in your mind, sub postmasters and mistresses, um, other reasons to account for lead to errors and shortfalls? Any or all of those, yes. Uh, and just pursuing this as far as we can, you've um, answered Miss Kennedy's questions about this, but what was done that you can recall now to look into the difference? Uh, those different possibilities? I, I, I do not know. Um, that, that's the position. All right. Uh, can we then look at the flip side, which is this? We reach the stage whereby the impact program suggests that the, loc the ability to put um, uh, the, uh, uh, the error or the shortfall into the, sus the branch, account, branch suspense accounts was eliminated. Now, um, what happened to that money? Now, it's not real money, or is it? Sorry, what, which, which money? Well, the, the 10 million in yeah. the suspense account. Now, is that real money in your mind, or is it notional money? Well, uh, if, 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 I, if I refer back to um, a document uh, that Miss Kennedy showed me, which talked about 10% being real debt. Um, it could be that, that some of that 10 million was related to discrepancies or, or, or potential debt uh, arising from timing discrepancies in as data flow through the system. Right. That's 10 percent. Well, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, that's one possible, one possible uh, constituent of, of 10 million. Well, that's leaving 9 million. The other 9 million no, I think it's the other way around. I think it's if 10% is is 10% is debt and 90% is timing, oh, then I see. So when this uh, branch account, suspense, when this ability for the branches to put money into the suspense accounts was eliminated, what 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 happened within the accounting system of Pol to that figure? It can't I, just be eliminated, can it? Well, it, it, it can't just be eliminated, but the, the purpose of, of, of uh, you know, where finance is, if that is an amount of money that is deemed um, owed or debt, then the analysis must show what what has caused, what is it that's causing it? And it won't be, I, I'm, I'm positive that it won't be one single factor. There'll probably be a number of factors involved in it. And finance would then seek to, to, to deal with each of those factors is, is the way that I would expect uh, it to be approached. Uh, and the way that you're speaking about this is, is with a considerable amount of caveat. You're saying that, um, well, first of all, you um, accepted a point made by Miss Kennedy as to the possible makeup of the money, the, the 10 million. Yeah. Secondly, you will believe that finance would have dealt with it. Do you have any actual direct knowledge of what happened? No, I don't. I don't. I'm sorry. So, so is, is one possibility that the sub-postmasters and mistresses were pursued for that amount of money as debt? Uh, yes. As I, 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 it, it, it's possibility, yes. Excuse me one moment, sir. Thank you, sir. Just a few short questions from me. Um, it's Flora Page also representing some of the sub-postmasters. Um, you've told us in your statement that uh, you weren't able to sort of put your hand on any particular user feedback, although you know some was created. I can yeah. take you to that yeah. if you like, yeah. But, yeah. but yes. yes. Um, have you got any idea of why it's not been possible to locate that at this stage? 
No, but you know, all, all, all I can say is that there should have been a document library and an archive created that contains the full set of documents relating to impact from start to finish, business change included. Um, and would that document library have potentially included records of uh, board papers or anything of that nature? Yes. Um, possibly even records of important meetings at which it was discussed? Yes. Uh, you know, it, it's standard practice um, that, that um, you know, a, a document library is created and, and then and then held, um, you know, for, for a, a considerable period of time. So it's slightly unusual, is it, that we find ourselves in a situation where we've got some papers, but we don't seem to have any meeting notes, we don't seem to have any of, of your user feedback. Uh, in other words, that what we've got is rather patchy. Yes, I, 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 I think that's... You know, it, it, although there's a, a long period of time between today and, and what we're talking about, um, you know, it's it's unfortunate that, that there isn't the record there to to help the conversation that we're having. Thank you. Um, you've mentioned that uh, you think that there should have been, whether there was or not, we don't know, but there should have been something of a report into this fivefold increase in the suspense accounts. Um, who do you think would have been responsible for that? Well, it, it would sit in in finance um, with the finance team um, to to uh, understand, investigate, analyse, and and produce um, appropriate outputs. So perhaps Graham Corbett at, sitting at the top of that. Um, Yes, um, I can't. You know, I, I, I can't remember the names, the particular names at, at this point in time. But you know, senior finance managers, and particular those that that, that worked with the the suspense account. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, you you've told us also that um, you would envisage a report into the types and numbers of criminal prosecutions yeah. uh, for discussion at post office management level again. Where would the responsibility for that sit, and, and what managers would you have envisaged having those sort of discussions? Well, the investigation team, um, as, as a function, was at one point in time uh, with Royal Mail Group, uh, but then each of the businesses took on um, investigation in-house by taking some people from, from groups. So there was an investigation team in terms of organisational structure, um, I'm not sure whether the investigation team for post office counters would have sat in finance or separately somewhere in operations. But um, you know, if if you're looking at weaknesses in in your systems, which are resulting in investigations taking place, then there is analysis that takes place at a national level to understand how many, what time, what amounts. Um, so that it gives you the opportunity to close out and take rectification steps where, where you know, there are weaknesses. Did you ever see a document of that nature? Not, um, no, I, I, maybe in the, maybe in uh, the early 90s um, at, at, at a group level. Um, because, of course, when you're looking at um, the situation um, in the businesses, you, you do need to understand what, what's going on um, in terms of investigations. But you don't believe you saw one during the period that the impact programme was being developed? And Certainly not, no. 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 Uh, but you believe one should have been done? Well, I... Or something I, along I, those lines? I, I, I can only say that I would expect uh, that the people involved in that would, would be doing that. That's, yes. it's, it, they should be doing that, yes. Um, just finally, you've very fairly acknowledged that the impact programme required Horizon Cash account data to be reliable 
And of course, we know now that it wasn't um, in a very large uh, number of cases, perhaps not a, a, by any means a majority, but a significant number of cases. Looking back, do you think that as SAT was designed and created alongside it, and perhaps not fully intentionally, but um, at certainly at some stage intentionally, there was a sort of development of a myth that Horizon cash account data was um, absolutely reliable? Um, myth. I, I, I think business decisions um, have to be based on an understanding that what is coming out of the system is accurate and reliable. Um, if if at, at a management level um, there is a suspicion that, that it may be flawed in some way, then that causes or should cause um, you know a lot of thought and consideration. I don't know myth. You know, I, 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 I'm not sure about myth, but. Uh, if there was perhaps um, an unwillingness to, to, to sort of investigate those possibilities. Yes, I, I think, uh, you, you know, this is something that uh, having, having listened to, to some of the, the, the testimony, you know, they, you know, stepping back and, and um, looking at, at what's going on, um, making use of the various types of different view or data that would exist in the business um, may, may have, have helped. Um, I don't know if that took place or, or not, but having heard what I've heard, you know, uh, in the lead up to being here today, you would, you would expect there to be some stepping back and looking. Thank you, those are my questions. Good morning, Mr. Grayston. My name's Angela Patrick, and again, I act with Mr. Maloney uh, and Hudgel solicitors for another group of sub-postmasters. Um, I don't have a lot of questions for you, um, but Miss Kennedy has asked you a number of questions about your involvement in Horizon during the development stages, testing and acceptance, and during the rollout. I don't want to go back quite that far, but I want to look uh, and ask a few questions about the end of the rollout, so before impact. Right. And I want to look at two documents and ask a few questions about them. Uh, and the first is Paul 20104602. And can you see that, Mr Grayson? Yes, yes. Uh, and we can see that it's an email, um, headed electronic memo, from Don Howe, to Keith Baines, sent on mm. 6th of September 2000. Can you see that? Yes, I can, yes. Uh, and it's headed Horizon NRO Closed Down Reporting. Uh, NRO, would that be national rollout? It would, yes. Uh, and if we scroll down a little, we don't need to look at the substance of that email, but we can see it's got a second email attached to the bottom part of that. Uh, and that's an email from Don Gray, copied to a number of people, yes. including, I think, yourself. You can see Steve Grace in there. Would that be you? Yes. Uh, and this is one that was sent on the 5th of September 2000. Uh, and we can see, again, same title. But it says, initial draft for comment, please confirm requirements with NRO board. So this is a document being sent to you for comment. Is that fair? Yes. Um, and if we can go over the page, we can see what the document is. Uh, and we can see uh, this paper documents the process to be adopted by the Horizon implementation team to close the national rollout project issued for initial comment. So were you being asked here to comment um, on the plans for closed down reporting? So or how the closed down reporting for the end of the rollout project was to be conducted. Yes, it was uh, put together by uh, Don Gray. Um, and at that point in time, 
um, I think I was I was working for Douglas and part of Don Gray's team. Yes. So you were part of the Horizon implementation team for the rollout. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and involved in conducting the review or part of it. Yes. Thank you. And this this may be very basic, but this was how the post office was proposing to learn any pertinent lessons they could from how the rollout had gone? Um, I'm not sure in terms of scope whether it talked about lesson, uh, lessons learned. I mean, I'd need, to, I'd need to sort of have a look at more of the, the document. But uh, yes, I mean, it should, it should refer back to lessons learned and you know, opportunities for improvement, etc. Um, we don't need to go into the detail of this document because it's planning for how the review would be conducted. I'd like to look at the second document I'd like to ask some questions about, and it's Paul 20104482, please. And we don't have a cover email for this, but I can see on the top right hand side, can you see that, Mr. Grayson? There's a date. Yes. And it says draft. Uh, and it seems to be the 5th of April 2001. So this is some time on from the initial email. Yes. And the heading is Project Implementation Review, Horizon National Rollout. Is it likely this was a draft of the review that you may have seen for your input? Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, documents, th there should be one or I'd expect one report um, that Don was, was pulling together. There may be different takes on the material in that report for different audiences. Okay. If we can turn to page 10, um, and there are appendices or annexes to this document, but if we look at page 10 to start with, it may help okay. with your memory. Um, and we can see that Appendix A is post-implementation review of field management. And if we scroll to the bottom of that page, there's a distribution list, which you aren't on. But if we can scroll over to page 13, there's an acknowledgements list. At bullet point two. And we can see there at the second paragraph, main contributors include Dawn Gray, Douglas Craig, Steve Grayston. Mm -hmm. So is it likely that you would have been a contributor to at least part of this review process? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's clearly from paragraph one. What you've got is um, inputs from the field teams, the four field teams, and the management of those four field teams. I recognise all those names. Paragraph two is the head office team. Um, yes. Uh, and uh, as you said, there were some things that would have been behind, within your domain, others that wouldn't, but you may have been involved in reviewing different documents. You said that to Miss Kennedy earlier. Yes. I don't propose to go all through all of this document. There are two issues I want to look at to see if you can help the inquiry. Um, whether you've seen it uh, or not, you may be able to, it may refresh your memory if we look at it, if we go through. If we turn to page five, the first issue, that I wanted to ask some questions about arises there. And we can see there's a heading there, uh, uh, headed bullet five, uh, and it says performance operational. Can you see that, Mr. Grayson? Yes. Uh, and I want to scroll down to the sixth bullet point. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the sixth point on that page, I apologise. It's performance technical, it's actually the next section down. I apologise, thank you for your patience. And we can see the section there reads, technical oversight and validation of ICL pathway activities was almost non-existent compared with the preceding live trial and development phase. Although this was not really a problem, it is an area that should not be overlooked either in horizon maintenance phase or in future projects. And I think you can see immediately below there, it says a full lessons learned report was going to be it. Appendix A, which we've just looked at, and Appendix B. Uh, and if we can turn down to page six, please. 
we can see some recommendations there. And 9.1 is headed supplier issues. And I want to look at bullet point two, which reads, if we can read it together, we should never again put ourselves in the positions of dependence on either a sole supplier or indeed supplier dominated project progress information without first establishing a defined and adequate contingency. At the outset, we should assure customer preeminence with any future supplier who must commit to identify, agree and deliver to our requirements, including detailed performance metrics and integrated reporting structures. Furthermore, any future supplier must empower their local field teams to mirror the responsibilities we invest in our people. Uh, and then if we can look at the third bullet, it says, improving the way we manage our chosen supplier, having more than one route without proper technical backup can make us look both unprofessional and vulnerable. And I simply want to ask, I don't know if this refreshes your memory of this at all, but can you recall at the time this review at the end of the rollout was being conducted, was there a recognition within Paul that Paul had been very reliant on Fujitsu in the development and also during the rollout of Horizon? Um, well, in terms of what you've shown me and, and the comment that you've, you've referred me to, this, this was about implementation, not about Horizon more generally. Um, so on the point that I think is being made here in recommendations, um, ICL Pathway had subcontracted various pieces of work to different organisations, and that had led to difficulties uh, through uh, and challenges through through the implementation. In terms of, I think your question, uh, which I think is 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 wider, um, the reliance on ICL Pathway. Yes, um, um, Post Office Limited, uh, Counters Limited was was reliant uh, on ICL Pathway, understanding the nature of their role and, and executing it appropriately. Uh, and I think, sorry, I'd just add to that. I think you've already seen, um, and I've seen in the material, concerns over visibility um, and openness um, and the nature of the contract and the limitations of the contract. So, yes, I mean, I think this particular point was about implementation. I understand it. I do remember it. And if I just go back to that phrase that was used on page five, uh, and we don't need to turn it back up again, but technical oversight and validation of ICL pathway activities was almost non-existent compared with preceding live trial and development phase. Yes. Um, whether it's implementation or not, the conversation there is about technical oversight and validation. Of implementation. Being non-existent. And then there's a reflection continuing on, on improving the way we manage our chosen supplier. And I think that's forward looking for new projects. But can you recall if there was any concrete plan for change in the relationship between Paul and Fujitsu to improve technical oversight and validation going forward? Well, the, the technical oversight and validation was around the steps that were required to, to undertake implementation, which was effectively a, you know, a migration to the new world. Um, and so to answer your question, no, because there would not be another technical rollout or implementation of a similar type with ICL pathway. That, that activity had been done. However, for post offices purposes, the, you know, should we be working with um, another supplier and we had a large banking program, post office card account, for example, the, the learning points about how we manage implementation 
those points should should be taken on board for future programmes. And of course, I think you were continuing to work with ICL Pathway and thereafter Fujitsu on the what we, we start calling the business as usual operation of Horizon. Yes. And any other projects connected with Horizon that would be conducted by Pathway and then Fujitsu, is that fair? Correct, yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to leave that point and go to the second point, and it's to look at some of the detail in the lessons learned in this document. If we could turn to page 30 to start, there are a few points I'd like to look at to see if they uh, are consistent with your recollection of the review at the end of rollout. <coughs> Uh, and if we look at Appendix B, and we start at the bottom of this page, page 31, what I want to look at runs over the page onto page 31. If we can see the, the, the very last paragraph, the overall strategy towards training was not in tune with the correct contractual relationship that exists between post office network and so, sub postmasters. The requirement running over into the next page, please. Um, the requirement for sub-postmasters and their assistance to pass a PSA, personal standard assessment after training, caused some inconsistent anomalies within the network in terms of offices reaching the minimum training compliance to enable migration to be completed, lack of a proactive approach by territories in this area, detailed information on PSA failures, and provision of training materials from ICL pathway have exacerbated the problem. Um, and if we can just, um, on training, you've said a little to Miss Kennedy already this morning about your recollection of training. Is that summary there consistent with your recollection of concerns around training during the rollout? Uh, well, even prior to rollout, well, f first of all, uh, you know, tra training was was part of the program that that uh, I think uh, the inquiries heard from uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Trevor Rollison. Um, but as a team, um, head office or regional, we were getting feedback um, on what on what was, you know, the struggle. Um, and yes, I mean, I, I I think the 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 work done pre rollout to improve training, which was AI 218, I think, um, was was seen as extremely helpful. But nevertheless, with with a user population so large, the, there were people who could not um, could not cope with with Horizon. Um, and they failed um, a test that had been introduced um, to assess competency. And if we see just the paragraph below that one, it continues, the policy for out-of-hours transactions is at best a stopgap. There are client and account team issues that need to be addressed. This was being written in May 2001 at the end of the rollout. Can you recall what the key client and account team issues that still needed to be addressed were? No, um, it, it would have been clear at the time. Um, but out of hours, transactions um, were used on occasions for certain product types. Um, but I can't remember um, in the context of what's said here, what, what the implication was. Okay. Um if we can go back, go down to page 32, please. Uh, and I want to look at bullet point 3.4, please. Can you see that, Mr. Grayson? Yes. Thank you. Um, and you can see there, um, I'm, I don't want to look at the whole thing, but the third paragraph down, there is an entry which says, Cash account training was not comprehensive enough within the training delivered by ICL Pathway. The training delivered by ICL Pathway was poor 
in terms of the instructors have little or no knowledge of post office procedures. Again, just to be absolutely clear, is that consistent with your recollection as to the conclusions of the post office at the end of rollout in 2001? Uh, yes, although looking at it today, I think that there probably would need to be a reflection on what was done to boost uh, that training. But, it, it, you know, if, if I looked at it in a different way, Peritas, who, who I think that was their name at, the, at one point in time, had been appointed to run the training, um, didn't have didn't have a post office background, uh, didn't understand um, all of the processes associated with it. So for Peritas or the supplier of training to come in and, and run good training courses, even with time and good material, was again, I think, a, you know, a learning curve on their side. Um, I think there was a reflection that the cash account training wasn't comprehensive enough. Um, and through AI 218 and the negotiation that I think uh, Bruce McNiven uh, was involved in, um, that was improved. That was improved. Um, but this AI 218 takes us to acceptance yes. and rollout, which starts in January 2000. This is being drafted in May 2001. Yes. And it's being recorded here that the training on the cash account had not been comprehensive enough. Was that, in your recollection, the view of post office in May 2001? Sorry, I, I wasn't clear. I think, I think in, in my mind, this reflection sh should have had two elements to it. That, the, that it absolutely wasn't, and that there was an intervention as a result of AI 218 that had improved things. Uh, it does not say that here. Um, and your interpretation, uh, you know, it, it's, is, is reasonable from what is said here. Um, but the, the quality of the training that was given, um, I believe, was deemed to, to be adequate. And the reason I say that is that there were four implementation teams nationally. And the head office team had worked with the regional teams through the lifetime of this program. And the regional teams represented the business operations around the country and also reflected the needs of the program in, in implementing in the various parts of the country. If that feeling, as expressed here, was so black and white, then it would have been stopped. The regional management of Post Office Counters Limited w would have stepped in. So I, I think, I under, in my mind, I, I, you know, I'm taking the interpretation that it wasn't good enough and it improved. There, there was nothing coming out from the implementation teams or regional management that said every week this training is not good enough it is not good enough um so you know that that's that's my thought on this okay. but that's not reflected in the draft that we have here <laughs> yeah as i say your interpretation of 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 what's said here um yes yeah if we can go over to 3.6 which is over the page on page 33 it might help elaborate on this thinking. Uh, and can you see that now, Mr. Grayson? I think it's come up. P point three point six, which deals with pre and post go live support. Yes. And it says more in depth training for those people who supported second, third, and fourth balance support, especially around suspense account entries. The scheduling of retail network manager was not consistent with instances of more than one arriving at an office to, to offer support. Uh, the allocation of support for balances worked better when the scheduling was undertaken by the cluster groups. Offices were given the impression that they would have a trained person with them for the first balance. Far too many did not have anyone, leaving them to flounder 
with an inadequate balancing guide. Um, and if we scroll down further to 3.8, 3.8 deals with the documentation given to sub-postmasters, and it says, in the latter stages of the project, changes arising from revised documentation have been deployed before the documentation had been signed off. Operational instructions and balancing guides were excellent. The quick reference cards poor, as were the arrangements for CSR+. Plus. The distribution of documentation on the whole was poor, with a number of offices receiving their balancing guides well after their go live. Uh, and it goes on the diagrams in the Horizon User Guide were not well accepted, as it contained too many flowcharts, and it says some more about training. Um, coming back to your understanding of the position of sub-postmasters during the rollout, was this the reflection of the implementation team at the end of the rollout, looking back, that some SPMs, some sub-postmasters, had been left to flounder? Well, the, the, from the position of the implementation processes and the role of the HFSO, which, which um, I knew because I'd been involved in the design of that role, um, there was, it was an agreed process that at the point of migration, implementation and migration, the field support officer would guide uh, the manager and staff through the process and would be there um, at the first cash account after, after um, implementation. And that subsequent cash accounts, if necessary, would have some level of support from the retail line. So business as usual retail operations as the implementation team was moving on. So, so there was no intention of um, sub-postmasters um, or, or any of their staff uh, being being intentionally left to flounder. I, I wasn't asking about what was intended. Mm. I apologise if there was any confusion. Simply that the reflection here, looking back on what could be learned from the rollout process, yeah. in May 2001, it was being recorded here that the post office was rec recognising that some sub postmasters had been left to flounder. That, that's what it says. Yes, that's what it says. Thank you. I've got one last question. Uh, if we could look at page 34, please, at the bottom. And I want to look at 3.10, which is headed other. And can you see that, Mr. Grayson? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and this section starts. The helplines are not seen as an effective support to the network. There seems a lack of knowledge and a reluctance to pass to a higher level for resolution. Installing up to the 8th of December was a mistake. Yeah. The number of errors generated post-go-live post go is directly linked to poor cash account training. An extra half day should have been allowed. The legacy left due to the migration use of the suspense accounts needs to be resolved. The rollout plan appeared to take no account of office size or pressure periods. This operational information should be included within the, the scheduling process. Overall, the size of the project was immense and has been a success, which is mainly due to attention to detail, focus, meaningful reviews and a lot of hard work by so many people. Um, I have a few questions about this. So I thought eight. you only had one, um, Ms. Patrick. It's one point, sir, but it's about 3.10, which, as you can see, covers a lot of detail. Um, yeah, I, I'm slightly concerned that we're revisiting phase two exclusively in this uh, part of your questioning, and I'm not sure to what extent I want to do that, but OK, one last point. Thanks, sir. Um, we're at the end of the rollout, and 
is this an, an understanding that at the end of the rollout, at this point, May 2001, Post Office was acknowledging that the helplines were not seen as an effective support to the network? Well, that's, that's what it's uh, saying. Thank you. Uh, and Ms Kennedy's already highlighted some problems would be problems that were flagged by sub-postmasters in their branches. Yes. Were helplines reluctant to pass up to a higher level for resolution when a problem got to them? I, th I think you would need to speak to the, to the, to the help desk management. Um, they shouldn't. Um, it, it, it weakens and devalues um, the purpose of a help desk or helpline if the appropriate action isn't, isn't taken in terms of escalation. And you see that there's a number of energy, uh, errors being generated post go live. Um, is that consistent with your recollection? I, I, I think there, there, there was a recognition that there were some errors as, as people were learning to use the system. Um, yes, but there was no feedback that, I'm aware, that, that I can recall from the field teams and, and, and operational management that the level of challenge was, was so significant as to undermine the, the continuation of rollout. And so here at the end of rollout in May 2001, the, the, the errors are being attributed, it says directly linked yeah. to poor cash account training. Is that consistent with your recollection? I, 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 I don't know. The, 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 the author, um, presumably, uh, or whoever wrote this particular point, would have had the analysis to, to create that linkage. <laughs> As one of the individuals that were involved in the team putting together this review, we've already looked at the acknowledgement, the reference to non-existent technical oversight and validation during the implementation process. Did anybody involved in the review, in your recollection, consider whether these errors that were arising post-go live might not be attributable only to training but to problems with the technology itself? Yes, that's a, uh, uh, that's a very good question. Um, at the time, at the time, um, uh, you know, I think the, 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 the working um, assumption was that the system was reliable and robust and producing outputs that could be trusted. And therefore, the, the, the reflection of cash account or training is, is what you see here. Um, whether that was, uh, you know, an assumption that was appropriate is now very questionable. Um, do you call just, this is the last question, if anybody in your team or anybody else in Paul at all may be involved in this review or not, can you recall if anybody joined the dots or tried to join the dots between a lack of technical oversight and validation and continuing problems with the cash account. Yeah, I, sorry, I just need to take you back to your linkage here. The technical oversight was about implementation, technical aspects of implementation, infrastructure, hardware, software, software failures, and aspects of, of that oversight for implementation. If you're asking me about joining the dots in a more general sense, there were thing, there were challenges, there were discrepancies, and was anybody stepping back and, and looking at this overall? Um, I don't know that there was. Um, Thank you, Mr. Grayson. We don't have any more questions for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Grayson, for coming to give evidence and answering the questions put to you. So is that it for today, uh, Ms. Kennedy? Uh, yes, Chair. We return tomorrow with Mr. Sean Turner and Ms. Anne Alaker. All right. See you in the morning. Bye.